The title of this presentation is Some Practical Aspects of Fatigue for Nozzles and Branch Connections. My name is Tony Pollan from the Pollan Research Group in Houston, Texas. This presentation focuses on understanding when fatigue is important in design and practical aspects of fatigue analysis. As you might have guessed by looking at this first slide, we want to emphasize and recognize when and how a system can cycle. If a system cycles, the system is subject to failure by fatigue and our stress calculations are probably important. If a system does not cycle, it still might burst, creep, or deform excessively, but it is likely not subject to failure by fatigue and our stress calculations might not be so important. The fact that many of our tools produce poor stress calculations is really not a problem because most of our systems just don't cycle significantly. So it's very important to recognize when a system is subject to significant cycles because that's when the stress analysis is critical. Most piping and pressure vessel systems cycle less than a thousand times during a 20-year life. So a thousand cycles in a 20-year life is one pressure and temperature cycle each week of the facility life. Many petrochemical facilities do not even cycle a thousand times, and it's for this reason that accurate stress analysis for fatigue oftentimes just isn't that important. So when people say, I've never had a fatigue problem, it may be that their systems just don't cycle. So if you're working on a below creep temperature component that cycles once every three years, you probably won't have fatigue problems unless the stress calculations are hugely in error. For complex processes or complex sales distribution scenarios, it can be surprisingly difficult to get cycle information. Sometimes you have to find the process engineer and sit down with him and explain what you need and why you need it to get a realistic projection of cycle histories. Based on our experience, if a system has significantly loaded components that cycle more than about 10,000 times, close attention should be paid to the accurate estimation of the load and prevention, prevention of fatigue damage, i.e. the stresses should probably be calculated as accurately as we can get them. Or let's say that the limit is 3,000 cycles if the stresses are high. What is meant by fatigue failure? The answer for Markle, which is the basis of the B31 codes, is that fatigue failure is a through wall crack in a non-corroded pipe and the appearance of water outside the pipe. For the ASME smooth bar approach, fatigue failure is a 25% reduction in load in an axial smooth bar specimen during test, which generally equates to about a, a crack depth of three millimeters. So let's take a look at the appearance of different types of through wall fatigue cracks. On the left is a cracked elbow. The finite element model on the bottom shows high stresses at the crack location. This cracking was due to repeated large displacement caused by dynamic loading in a relatively unsupported pipe. The rightmost figures show a crack and leak that occurred due to pressure cycling of a vessel with a welded flat head. This test was run by Chris Hennant and used to help verify the fatigue method used in Part 5 of Section 8, Division 2. The crack and leaks here are at the toe of a girth weld at the flanged base of a 4-inch standard wall carbon steel pipe in a Markle fatigue test. The cantilever in the test is repeatedly flexed in bending a fixed distance until water appears at the base of the test. Here's another Markle fatigue crack leak at a 4-inch standard wall unreinforced intersection weld. This is a pinhole leak that occurred during a pressure cycle test. The run is a 20 inch by half inch wall pipe and the nozzle is a two inch schedule 40 pipe. The crack area occurs in the longitudinal direction of the pipe as we might expect. You can see from this figure what the crack area looks like and why we see only a pinhole leak at the surface. Here's some additional close ups of the pinhole leak and the excavation that followed the crack from the surface to the ID of the pipe. We can also evaluate fatigue failures in small specimens. These are drawings of high cycle carbon steel fatigue test specimens for a rotating bar test. The rotating bar test pieces shown here are specimens without a discontinuity 
with a discontinuity. This is a machine discontinuity. And then a specimen with a discontinuity and a weld. Here's the rotating bar uh, testing machine that we use at PRG in Houston. The motor and the counter is here at the top. The moment arm and the carrier is here at the bottom. And the test piece is in the middle. This picture shows a mounted smooth specimen that's ready for test. And here's one polished specimen after failure. You can see the crack in the middle of the piece. This is a close-up of the crack in a fairly poorly polished specimen. You can note the circumferential markings from the 900 grit paper used to polish the outside of this, uh, this test piece. Here's another shot of the crack uh, at its edge. This is a picture of a, of a failure in a welded test rotating bar specimen. Here's a close-up of that weld failure. Here's an additional close-up of the small crack at the weld following the surface undulation in the material as might be expected. Small specimen rotating cycle tests for carbon steel materials in the high cycle range can take us to the ASME axially loaded polished bar fatigue curves. We can put the PRG rotating bar test failures on the ASME curve along with some other test curves to see the comparisons. The welded specimens are to the left of the Section 8 Division 2 polished bar curve and they have stress concentration factors of from 2.54 to about 2. These points in the middle are from the poorly polished polished bar specimens. And this test at the far right is from the well polished polished bar specimen, which lies very close to the Section 8 Division 2 polished bar curve. This is the Hennant Pollen curve from the PVP 61871 paper written by Chris Hennant and Tony Pollen, mostly Chris Hennant, outlining their Markle type uh, cantilever tests that were run in 2007. The Markle curve is also shown here. The Markle fatigue strength is seen to be smaller in the low cycle range and higher in the high cycle range. But at about 40,000 cycles where these tests are run, or at least where the welded portion of the tests are run, all of the methods seem to agree reasonably well. From the fatigue performance of large girth welded steel tubes by Maddox, additional failure points can be taken and put on those curves. Here's a single-sided and the double-sided welds that they tested. These were for 24 inch diameter by 3 quarter inch thick pipes. These are larger pictures of the plots from the previous page. Note that some welds show an endurance limit and some welds don't. The Maddox tests suggest that larger specimens, real pipe, don't show endurance limits. Petrago at Stress Engineering in Houston also ran a number of fatigue tests on girth boat welds of various types in larger diameter pipe in the higher cycle ranges. Notice that the largest tests in the Petrago set are in the 10 to the 8th cycle range and that many of those didn't even fail. Now let's add the Markle and the Hennet curves to the ASME curves and to the test data points. So Markle we can see is low, which is conservative in the low cycle end. And the Markle curve is a bit high, or at least with respect to the Hennet curve and the Bertrago test, it's a bit high in the high cycle end. The Hennet curve seems to be accurate for both the low cycle and the high cycle data. For elastically calculated stresses in, say, the 200 to 2e to the 8th cycle ranges, the Hennet curve looks pretty reasonable with respect to the test data that we have. And so anything that agrees with it is likely pretty reasonable too. Notice how that in the 10,000 to 200,000 cycle range in here, it's really difficult to tell the difference between Markle, ASME, and the Hennet methods. So in this range, if we can't tell the methods apart, any one of them can really be used and we'll get results that are certainly within the scatter of the test data. So we've talked about failures and leaks and the accuracy of fatigue failure predictions. But what do we use for design? Could be that we take the maximum allowable stress and make it equal to one half of the mean failure stress. So if the calculated stress is in error by two times or the calculated moments are in error 
by two times and the calculated stress is close to the allowable, then the actual design stress in the system would be equal to the stress that would cause failure in 50% of the parts. So let's see how that, uh, that looks pictorially. So here is a point that would be close to our allowable line. So if the stress calculation is off by two, then the stress calculation would move here. If the moment calculation is also off by two, then the calculation would be moved to here. And the system would be expected to start showing cracks at around a thousand cycles when the design life was really for 10,000 cycles. Now, will the stress calculation be off at the same time as the moment calculation? Well, we could argue that if the I factor is off, that the K factor is likely off too. But the question is, do you want to have to guess when you're calculating cyclic stresses for a system? So a simplified look at the design criteria shown on this graph. We think we know at what stress the part will fail. The allowable is designed to give us a separation from the failure stress. How did Markle view this allowable stress approach? Markle used the word safety factor for the separation of the design allowable from the mean failure line. And he gives examples for safety factors of different piping. He gives them as 2.2 for power piping, 1.67 for oil piping with air allowable, a 2.04 for oil piping for stainless, and 1.91 for power piping or oil for uh, type 347 stainless. Markle states the safety factor is found to be on the order of two. Markle also emphasizes the need for making a conservative estimate of the number of cycles and goes on to say that the minimum safety factor close to two would be more than ample provided the actual stresses are evaluated properly. So a simplified look at our design criteria again with Markle. Markle suggests about two times. So yes, it seems reasonable that we want to shift the allowable stress from the mean of the failure stress by about two times. Some folks like a probabilistic approach to separation. So if we can express the allowable and mean failure stresses using equations one and two, where NA is the allowable number of cycles at the allowable stress, SA, if M is the slope of the fatigue curve on a log-log plot, if NF is the number of cycles to produce failure in half the samples at a stress equal to SF, and then if we're interested in the ratio of SF over to SA, and we want to define SA as the stress that will provide a 99% probability of survival or a three standard deviation shift from the mean failure line, we can ratio equations one and two to get equation three. The standard deviation based on log N of all welded test specimens collected by PRG in 2007 by Chris Hennant is a very reasonable value of 0.269. The best fit M from those same welded test data is 0.31483. So three times the standard deviation is calculated in equation four, the log of equation three is given in equation five, and the standard deviation of the log N from the data is inserted as the shift and so from the log of the ratio of the stresses, the value of SF over SA from the test data using three standard deviations is 1.8, which is very close to Markle's separation or Markle's safety factors of between 1.67 to 2.2. We still get an SF over SA value of about 1.8 or about a two time shift from the mean of the failure data to get to the allowable stress. We know in theory what we want to have happen but what does our reality look like? And our reality, unfortunately, tends to look like the black line in this image rather than the green line in the image. The horizontal axis here is design opportunities where an opportunity is a combination of piping or vessel components and its loads. So the black line reflects opportunities where a stress that's at 100% of the allowable is close to the mean failure line. What we want is all of our opportunities or all of the conditions that we evaluate in piping and pressure vessel systems to be shifted from the mean failure line by about two times. Our objective is separation consistency in our stress calculations and in our allowable evaluation.
when our calculated stress is equal to the allowable, we want it at this green line with respect to mean failure. We don't want some components close to failure and some components very far removed from failure. So when can the black peaks of the allowable curve exceed the mean failure line? Well, let's take a look at an example from Appendix D and B313, which in Note 11 states that when the D over D ratios between 0.5 and 1, the I factors provided by the code may be non-conservative. And they're non-conservative on the order of about 2. So this is a perfect example where the design line moves closer to the failure line. Let's look at some other well-known conditions where the, the stress calculations can be non-conservative. So the high points in this plot are the non-conservative conditions, and the low points are the two conservative conditions. Well-known high or non-conservative points occur, as we saw in the last slide, when D over D is between 0.5 and 1. Additionally, when T over T is less than 1 for certain geometries, the I factors for piping may be too low. When the high stress is in the nozzle and we're using WRC 107, we know that 107 doesn't calculate the stress in the nozzle, so our stress calculations can be too low. For high cycle lives, Markle can be progressively non-conservative. The B31 or B313 equation 1D exponent of 5 is too high and is not conservative. The value used by all other welded codes in the world is closer to 3. The B31 codes worry, worry, warn about pressure cycling, but don't provide guidance. So as a real designer, as a piping designer, when pressure cycles significantly, we're on our own, unless you have a Nozzle Pro or FE107 or a similar tool. B313 doesn't include torsional sifts, so the stress calculation in this cal case can be off by the magnitude of the sift, which can be easily larger than two for big, big fittings. B31 codes give K factors a 1 for branch connections, and it's well known that these values can be considerably greater than 1. So there's definitely situations where we can be non-conservative in our stress calculations. Commonly over-conservative uh, conservative points also exist. These are uh, for branch connections with large lambda values, uh, where lambda is D over T to the 1 half times D over D. Uh, for WRC 297, when T over T is less than 1, nozzle stresses computed, computed by WRC 297 can be excessive by up to 3.6 times per WRC 335. For B31 runside branch connections, uh, when D over D is less than 1, the runside I factors for reduced branch connections can be considerably smaller than the I factors given in the code. So these are all conditions where we know our stress calculations or our allowable equations can be wrong, either way too high or way too low. And we want to be just conservative enough. So in short, when the separation between the allowable and failure is 2, and the stress calculation is off by 2, and the system cycles, our allowable stress is errantly close to our failure life. What do we do to stay on the green line? When we need consistently calculated stresses and allowables, we need Nozzle Pro, FE107, or a similar tool. Never having a failure doesn't mean that we have uniformly safe designs. If the error in the stress calculation is 2, and the safety factor is 2, and the system cycles, there can eventually be a failure. Let's take a look at some examples. This is a typical nozzle problem. The vessel OD is 36 inches, and the vessel thickness is 3 quarters of an inch. The nozzle OD is 14 inches, and the thickness of the nozzle is 1 half inch. We can immediately see and worry about the fact that T over T is less than 1. If we're using WRC 107, 537, or WRC 297, since the high stress can be in the nozzle, we know the WRC documents don't handle that condition well. If we put a pad on the vessel, the T over T ratio gets even worse. If this vessel cycles and the stress is close to the allowable, this is definitely a condition that should be evaluated carefully. So here's the FE107 input for this geometry. We basically enter four numbers, the diameter and wall thickness of the vessel and the diameter and wall thickness of the nozzle. Here's the FE107 input for the loads. We're given two moments a circumferential and a longitudinal moment, so we simply enter those values. Here's the finite element model that's created automatically by FE107. 
we press the run button and in one to two minutes we get the output shown here. FE107 was designed in part to compare FEA results to WRC results and to compute stresses on intersections due to external loads and pressure. The conclusions we see from this run are that if we used only WRC 107 or 537, we would not have calculated the stresses in the nozzle and our governing stress estimate would be two times too low. The FEA governing stress is 42 KSI and the 107 537 governing stress would be 21 KSI. If we use WRC 297, the governing stress would be 20% too high. WRC 335 also addresses the nozzle errors in WRC 297. In the two instances cited here, WRC 335 states that 297 can be over conservative by 3.7 to 3.6 times, not 20% like we saw in the past example, but 370%, which is generally considered too conservative. FEA results also show how the controlling stress drops 31% as the attached shell gets shorter. In this case, WRC 297 over predicts the stress in this nozzle by 55%. This is particularly important for heat exchangers, where nozzles are close to tube sheets, which stiffen the shell in the cross section and reduce the stresses, but also increase the stiffnesses. So let's try to put this discussion in context. A lot of what we do is focused on I factors and stress calculations. When there are errors with the I factors or the stress calculations, they're generally on the order of a maximum of about two times. So our stress calculation might be two times too low or two times too high, which just happens to correspond roughly with our separation from mean failure for fatigue. So our error is two and our safety factor is two. K factors or stiffnesses can have a much larger effect than two on stress calculations, both conservatively and non-conservatively. But the effect of the local stiffness on a branch connection on the load is tied to the configuration of the attached pipe and to the proximity of rotating equipment. So the need for accurate stress calculations is strongly affected by the number of cycles. The need for accurate stiffness calculations is strongly affected by the attached piping configuration, possibly by the number of cycles if the stresses are critical, and by the proximity of rotating equipment if the loads are critical. Accurate K factors and stiffnesses can have a very large effect on pipe designs around sensitive equipment. Let's say we use the right tool. We get the right stiffnesses and loads and stresses. When there are significant cycles, we need to make sure we know how to use the more accurate stresses. And this is the next step. Let's take a look at an example. We want to evaluate a typical weight plus temperature plus pressure load acting on a vessel nozzle or a branch pipe connection. For this example, the vessel diameter is 140 inches and the wall thickness is 3 quarters of an inch. The nozzle OD is 18 inches and its thickness is a half inch. Plus, there's a 6 inch wide repad that's 3 quarters of an inch thick. Now we notice immediately that the T over T ratio is much less than 1. So we expect the high stresses due to external loads will exist in the nozzle. In this case, we also expect the WRC 107 or 537 and the WRC 297 might not be of, of really much help. The number of design cycles for this example is 7,000. This is a fairly large number of, of full range load cycles. And so we probably want to pay pretty close attention to the stress calculation. So let's first take a look at how these stresses might vary. This graph shows temperature and pressure as a function of time during a typical startup and shutdown cycle. At point A, the unit begins the startup process. Pressure increases quickly while the temperature ramps up more slowly. So at point B, the system is experiencing a full pressure stress but almost zero thermal loading. At point C, both the temperature and the pressure are at operating conditions and continue at operating conditions until point D when the system shutdown begins. As might be expected, the pressure drops quickly and goes to zero while the te temperature lags behind. So at point E, we've got an operating temperature and essentially a zero pressure. At point A, we have zero temperature, zero pressure, 
At point B, we have pressure, no temperature. At point C and D, we have temperature and pressure. At point E, we have temperature only. And at point F, we have zero for both. So the question is, which of these stress states produces the worst stress cycle? It's often assumed that the A to C cycle is the worst. But vessel and heat exchanger engineers know that this might not be the case. For a complicated stress state in the nozzle, the software has to tell us. When is this important? As a minimum, our answer to when is this important is when the system cycles. So let's take a look at this example. The vessel has a 140 inch diameter with a 3 quarter inch wall thickness. The nozzle is 18 inches in diameter with a half inch wall thickness. And there's a 6 inch wide 3 quarter inch thick repad on the 18 inch nozzle. Forces are applied in the axial direction. Moments are applied in the circumferential and the longitudinal directions and there's a 185 PSI pressure in the vessel. On the optional form, we can see that these loads are applied to the vessel 7,000 times. This is once per day for about 20 years. The default finite element model is generated by clicking the plot button. When we're ready with the finite element model, we click the run button. After about a minute, the finite element run is completed and we look at the overstressed areas report. Plots are here on the right. The overstressed areas report can be found here in the table of contents. And we can see that there's no overstressed nodes in this model. Go back to the table of contents come down to the highest fatigue stress ratios. We can see that in the branch at the junction, there's a 35,000 PSI alternating peak stress and the allowables 41,000, which gives us a 0.85 damage ratio on stress. The default nozzle pro analysis is that temperature and pressure act simultaneously for the given number of cycles. And for that application of load, there's no problem for this nozzle in this vessel. So now we want to see if there's any change to the fatigue analysis if the pressure and temperature do not act simultaneously during heat up or cool down. We want to know if the pressure is applied before the vessel heats up or if the pressure drops before the vessel cools down. Does that affect the fatigue analysis? So to perform this more rigorous fatigue evaluation, we're going to press the Options button. We're going to look at ASME rules. There's a variety of options in the ASME rules panel. We want to establish rigorous fatigue load cases. We click this checkbox and rerun the analysis. When the run completes, we look again at the overstressed areas report. And we, we can see that the secondary stresses are now over the allowables. and that the alternating peak stress in the nozzle is more than 150% of the allowable. So the overstressed condition exists due to load case 6. So we're going to go back to the table of contents, take a look at the load case report, come down to load case 6. We can see that 6 is a range case it's the difference between cases 4 and 3. And these are the temperature and the pressure only cases.
So for this relatively common nozzle configuration, evaluating pressure and temperature independently significantly affects the fatigue life of the vessel. The largest stress range occurs between pressure and temperature cases and not between weight and the combined pressure and temperature case applied simultaneously. So when we asked for a rigorous analysis, Nozzle Pro not only evaluates or evaluated the simultaneous application of the loads, but also every permutation of the application of the loads. In these permutations we can find in the fatigue summary. So here are all of the permutations of the load cases that Nozzle Pro set up. So if we're concerned about fatigue, and if we have a significant fluctuating stress, it is probably a good idea to evaluate all permutations of the loading. After all, in Nozzle Pro, that is just one checkbox. How did the thermal to pressure case result in the largest stress range? This diagram oversimplifies the stress results to make these conclusions clear. In plane and axial external loads on the nozzle shown in the upper left are due to thermal expansion of the attached pipe. The stress distribution in the upper right is due to pressure. The in-plane moment and axial load are due to thermal expansion of the pipe, and the stresses from these two loads can be summed to get the thermal-induced stresses. The pressure stresses come directly from a pressure FEA analysis of the intersection or from WRC 368. The operating stress state is the sum of the in-plane, axial, and pressure stresses. To make the stress combinations easier to visualize, stresses are represented as small integer values and we assume the weight loads are negligible. The numbers at the top of the nozzle reflect the maximum stresses at the top crotch location and the stresses at the bottom of the nozzles reflect the stresses in the bottom crotch location. For example, due to the in-plane moment on the nozzle, there is a minus 3 at the top crotch location and a plus 3 at the bottom crotch location. The axial loads result in a minus 5 at the top and a minus 5 at the bottom. Since the axial and in-plane loads are due to thermal expansion of the pipe, the thermal stresses are the result of these two stress states summed together. And so at the top, the thermal stress is minus 3 plus minus 5, which is minus 8, and at the bottom the thermal stress is plus 3 minus 5 equals minus 2. The typical range is weight plus temperature plus pressure minus weight, or weight to operating. So if we assume the weight stresses are small, then W equals 0, so the typical range from weight to operating in this example is created by adding or superimposing the temperature and pressure stresses. So at the top of the nozzle, the temperature plus pressure stress is minus 8 plus 4, and that gives us minus 4. On the bottom of the nozzle, the stresses are minus 2 plus 4 or 2. The atypical stress range is from weight plus temperature to weight plus pressure. So the weight is negligible or cancels and or is zero. So at the top of the nozzle, the temperature to pressure stress range is minus eight, minus four, which is minus 12 at the top, or at the bottom it's minus two, minus four, which is minus six. So the largest stress range for the temperature to pressure case is 12. So in this example, the variation from temp temperature to pressure produces a three times bigger stress range than the variation from weight to operating. And that's what we saw in the nozzle pro analysis. The largest range is a function of the order of the loading and the magnitude of the various stress components. This illustrates our worst case stress range. It's from pressure only, which occurred here, to temperature only. So it's these two stress states that produce the worst range. This slide shows the stress versus time diagram and how the range from weight plus pressure to weight plus temperature can be greater than the range from weight to weight plus pressure plus temperature. And that again is what we saw in the nozzle pro analysis.
To have this comprehensive analysis performed each time a Nozzle Pro or FE107 run is made, we would press Options, then ASME Rules, then ask for a rigorous fatigue analysis. The setting can be saved locally or globally or just for the current job. If the option is saved globally, this evaluation will be performed each time a new Nozzle Pro run is made. The fatigue summary printed with each output clearly shows these results. For this model, the temperature to pressure stress range definitely produces the worst fatigue damage than the operating to weight stress range or any of the other stress ranges that were run by Nozzle Pro. So we used the right tool and we got the right answer and we performed a rigorous analysis. Is there a next step? We suspect that a similar analysis must be performed when there are also multiple operating cases. For a single operating case with three individual load components, where one is, is pressure, one is temperature, and one is weight, a rigorous cycle analysis resulted in five possible stress ranges. With three operating cases, having three unique temperatures and three unique pressures, there are at least seven individual load components. The approximation equation shown here suggests that three operating cases with seven unique components could result in seven raised to the second power plus seven over two equals 28 different load ranges. Making logical assumptions about which cases result in the highest stress ranges is almost impossible to do manually when there are a large number of cases with varying different load components. Combining cases can get especially complicated when one tries to apply the cycle counting methods of B313 or ASME. The B313 equation 1D indicates that the summation of any computed displacement stress range is to be used. This is an inadequate definition as the number of possible displacement ranges increases. A more appropriate approach is the min-max cycle counting method recommended in ASME Section 8 Division 2, Part 5, Appendix B. Each method is available in Nozzle Pro, FE107, and the PCL. The Equation 1D approach will always be conservative, but sometimes excessively conservative because it can add the same load component multiple times. Min-max cycle counting consumes the already used portions of ranges and provides a more accurate fatigue evaluation. So let's start with the last analysis and evaluate the following additional load conditions. So the load definitions in cases one through four shown here illustrate how the startup shutdown cycle from the last example is established for the normal once a day running condition that we've already looked at. So we start with weight, we go to pressure only because the pressure ramps up quicker than the temperature. Temperature follows, so then we hit the operating case. Once we reach operating and then we begin to shut down, pressure goes away first, leaving us with temperature only, and then we drop back to the weight case. So this is the first operating load case, start up to shut down. At the end of each week, the cycle runs a little bit longer and so the thermal loads are increased. So we've got an additional thermal case that only runs for a thousand cycles during the design life. So that's described here. We can see the pressures are a little bit higher, the thermal loads are a little bit higher, but the orientation of the loadings is the same as for the first case we analyzed. The system is also to be analyzed for 180 RV opening cases. So we have 180, 180 cycles of a 225 PSI pressure relief valve opening case. We also have a beat frequency that runs at 7 Hz for the entire life of the facility. At least that's the conservative design assumption. So that's equal to 4,415 million cycles. But the beat frequency occurs at a relatively low pressure of 15 PSI. But we want to include that in the fatigue analysis. Then we also have clean-out cycles of, of 50 with a somewhat low pressure but slightly higher thermal loads. So we want to include clean-out, the beat frequency, RV opening, and the two operating cases in this fatigue evaluation.
I will go back to Nozzle Pro to the run that we've already made. We access the load history processor using the button in the upper right hand corner of the Nozzle Pro or the FE107 menu. So we first want to enter the load history that reflects the daily startup and shutdown cycles that we've already analyzed using the rigorous load calculation. So we start with the weight case. We said we're going to assume that the weight loads are negligible, so we'll just enter all zeros for weight. Pressure ramps up first before thermal, so we go to 125 psi pressure with no temperature cases. In the load history, the temperature follows the pressure, so the next case will have pressure and the thermal loads, which were 3.0. So now this case, case 3, is operating, which is pressure and temperature. During shutdown, pressure drops off again quicker than the temperature, so we're left just with a temperature case. So the zero pressure and the thermal loads from the piping don't change any. So this is our first load case. Now we want to enter the second operating case, which is the weekend case with the higher temperatures. So it also starts with a weight case. Again, we'll assume, assume that the weight loads are all zero. Follows the same pattern, although we have less cycles for the weekend cases. First operating case, you might remember, cycles once a day for 20 years, so that's about 7,000 cycles. The weekend cases are of course only on the weekends, so that's about a thousand cycles during the design life. So the pressure for the weekend case is a little bit higher because the temperatures run a little bit hotter. So we need to enter the increased thermal loads. That's the operating case. Now pressure drops off, which leaves us with the weekend temperature case. No pressure. So there's our two operating cases. Now have the RV opening case. That occurs 180 times. The only loads that we have during the RV opening case are the increased pressure load. The beat frequency case occurs at 4,000 million cycles, but at a much reduced pressure at 15 psi. And the last load case we want to evaluate is the cleanout case. That occurs only 50 times at 80 psi, but slightly elevated piping loads. So what we would like Nozzle Pro or FE107 to do now is to perform the cumulative damage fatigue evaluation for all these variations of loadings. We don't need to reanalyze the finite element model. Enter the loads. Click the Analyze button. Here are results. Come into the Reports. Look at the stress results. Tabular results shown here list the, the input first, then maximum membrane bending and surface stresses, at the bottom we have all of the stress ranges that comprise the total damage. There's all the possible stress ranges for those load cases in the pad header at the junction. Here are all the possible stress ranges for those particular cases for the branch at the junction. You know this is the critical location. And this suggests that we're over the cumulative damage allowable. 
we can see that this report combines all cycle ranges per B311 equation 1D. Now we stated previously that this combination method can be excessively conservative. So let's go back into the advanced settings and change from using equation 1D to the more realistic min-max cycle counting methods from Section 8, Division 2, Appendix 5, Part 5, Appendix B. Reperform the analysis. See if we're still overstressed. with a more accurate combination of the loadings, we can see that we have far fewer loads because the maximum ranges consume the individual load components. And indeed now our cumulative damage, total cumulative damage, is less than one. You are probably wondering if we can import the loads from a PCL model into the load history screen. The answer is yes. Let me show you how that works. And in this case, we'll get a variety of loads from the different cases. Let's see, there's 19 different uh, load cases here with a variety of seismic and operating and sustained cases. We can plot how these load histories look. So these are the load histories we'll be analyzing. And we can perform the analysis just like we did before. Here are the reports, identical to those we've just analyzed, except all the additional load cases are included. Bending and surface stresses are calculated for each of the cases. And as we saw before, at the bottom we have the damage tables. Here's the damage in the branch at the junction for these applied loads cumulative damage factor is well over the allowable. We can also look at how these loads compare to allowables and failure stresses. We can import the loads into a failure calculator and look at the distribution of the loads with respect to the PVP paper the ASME smooth bar curve, and the Markle curves. We can look at mean failure plots, and we can look at allowable plots. So here's how the different points fall with respect to the allowable curve. See how they'd fall. Only a few of them would fall in or about the failure curves. Let's sort the cumulative damage to see which of these is the worst. So at 92,000 PSI and 2,000 cycles, let's see if we drop that to 1,000 cycles. Bad drops, but by nowhere near enough. Let's drop the stress, say in half. That got it below the allowable. Sort the cumulative damage again. See if we can drop this stress. And that would put all of our stresses individually below the mean failure curves if those stresses could be could be dropped like that. But that's what this utility is for so that the user can come in and adjust cycles and adjust stresses and see how that affects stresses in their 
placement with respect to allowables and or failure curves. And any of the load history results can be plotted. We can take a look at the damage on the outside. So this is the cumulative damage from all the different load cases. Here's the maximum location where the cumulative damage occurred. We can also go in and plot stresses on a per load case basis. Pick the load case we're interested in. Tell the software that we're interested in all the stress components, membrane bending, membrane plus bending on the inside, membrane plus bending on the outside, and the stress concentration factor. Ask it to generate those plots. Here are all of the stress components. Select the one that we think is going to be the worst. Find the highest stress, as we'd expect again in the nozzle, where the T over T ratio is less than one. So, as well as pulling up damage reports, stresses, forces, and moments, we can also plot any of the results that we generate using the multiple load case processor. From Nozzle Pro, we can also ask to look at I and K factor calculations. For this problem, we have an 18 by 60 large diameter branch connection. I just press the I and K factor button on the top of the Nozzle Pro screen. When the I and K factor form appears, the diameters and wall thicknesses from the Nozzle Pro problem are entered for me, although I could change these to any branch connection I'd like to analyze. Once we have the right data in, I press the Compute Update I and K button. Calculations are made for 0702, B313, NBNNC, Ditnorsky Veritas, Waste Rotoball from EPRI 110755 and 110996 for unreinforced branch connections, and from WRC 497. For 0702, that's welding tees, pad reinforced branch connections, unreinforced branch connections, extruded tees, sweep alettes, OLETs, and locally thickened nozzles. So what we're essentially doing here is comparing the 0702 SIFs and K factors to the B311, B313 SIFs and K factors to the NBNC nuclear code SIFs and K factors to the Donorsky Veritas values for the same to the Waste Widera updated values for the same uh, from the EPRI work and comparing the SIFs and K factors to the WRC 497 work by Dr. Widera. Reviewing the results from each of these gives us an idea of the accuracy of the B31 method that we're probably using in our piping analysis. For this example, we can see that the unreinforced branch connection for the out of plane I factor for the run, that's this one. So there's the unreinforced fabricated T. B313 would give us a value of 10.4. 0702 would recommend 1. The nuclear code would only recommend 2.7. And WACE would recommend 1. So what this suggests is that B31 is overestimating the stress at the branch connection by a factor of around 10. It would definitely be a waste to have to reroute any pipe because of an out-of-plane out of overstress at this branch connection. B313 in this case is simply overestimating the stress by about 10 times. K factors for this branch connection would be a number of around 43. This agrees fairly well with the 45 from WRC 497. B313 of course provides K factors of 1 for all branch connection components. So this is the equivalent of leaving out 43 diameters of straight pipe at this branch connection. This calculator helps give the pipe stress user an idea of the magnitude of the error, if there is any, in their current B31 calculations so they can make engineering judgments and adjustments as necessary. It's well known that there are areas of the code that are too conservative and other areas that are not conservative enough. The objective is that we just don't want to let any of these emissions result in damage or unnecessary expense for the projects.
But to summarize, we observed that using different philosophies, the desired separation between the allowable stress and the fatigue failure mean curve is about two times for what we're doing with pipe stress analysis. This means that if our calculated stress is close to the allowable and the calculated stress happens to be in error by two times or more because of one of the conditions we've identified in this presentation, at the end of the design life of our piping system or pressure vessel, we'd expect there to be cracking or leaks. Adjusting the allowable downward for all components to accommodate this error is likely a mistake because some components, we call them opportunities in the presentation, already have allowables that are too low. It just seems like a better idea to know first when we need to make an accurate stress calculation, which is not always, and second, we need to have the tools available to make better stress calculations when we need them. We say that you need pipe stress and pressure vessel software every day and Nozzle Pro every week. We saw that by just checking one box for Nozzle Pro and FE107, a rigorous fatigue analysis will be performed that will tell us if external loads on nozzles are susceptible to the load order problem we saw in the presentation. We emphasized that strain limited stresses like thermal loads probably don't need to be calculated that accurately when the systems they are in don't cycle significantly. You just don't need FEA every day. We emphasized that if the systems do cycle, that the stress calculation can be very important. And we probably don't want to add uncertainty to the computation if we don't have to. You don't need FEA every day, but when you do need it, it can make a big impact on your calculation. We saw that when load order is important, like for nozzles or branches, and when there are multiple thermal cases, a large number of stress ranges might need to be considered. In fact, we saw that the number of stress ranges is proportional to about one half the number of unique load components squared. We saw that the B31 equation 1D cycle combination method can be overly conservative when there are a large number of components. We also saw that the min-max cycle counting method used in section 8 while more complicated to implement, is more realistic. We saw that Nozzle Pro and FE107 make the cycle combination calculations for piping and pressure vessels automatically. We also saw cases where WRC 107, 537, and 297 may not provide adequate results. And we saw cases where the B31 Appendix D SIFs are non-conservative, and other cases where they're overly conservative. I hope that we properly emphasize the importance of determining the actual number of cycles a system must undergo, just like Markle did in the 1950s. And we use the value 10,000 for a nominal number of cycles to be concerned about, and the value of 3,000 cycles as a number of cycles to be concerned about when the stresses in the system are high. We saw a number of pretty interesting tools in Nozzle Pro and FE107 that most piping and pressure vessel engineers should be aware of. When cycles are high, there is no reason to make unnecessary guesses. Thank you for your time.